<laughs> Don't use them. Okay, so the jury's still out. But, uh, and I, I'm not a paranoid kind of person about it, um, but I, I take this precaution. The first precaution is I rarely put those uh, uh, pigments on my palette. I find, and I was very encouraged, by the way, to discover that Robert Jen, G-E-N-N, Robert Jen, Google him, get on his newsletter, get on his, twice a week he sends out an email that is fabulous. Anyway, I was tickled to death last week when he said that he finds he only needs two blues. They are Thalo Blue and Ultramarine, because for the last five or eight years, that's all I've used, phthalo and blue. So it's always nice when you find somebody kind of famous or you know well-known and a good painter that agrees with you. <laughs> did you see what I just did with my pinky there? I smeared that some of those lines then came back and painted on top of them. I'm doing palette knife. Anyway, so I don't use any uh, cobalt or cadmium, or when I do, I make a mental note. Now, here's why they might be toxic. Um, very few artists eat their paints. I'm very, very glad to say that very, very few of us eat our paints. <laughs> That's not the, the danger. The danger is they absorb through your skin. And that means when you have cobalt or cadmium on your brush, you put it in your brush cleaner, and then you pick it up and you have a rag in one hand and you clean your brush in the rag. What is happening? Some of that cobalt and cadmium is going through the rag into your fingers, into your skin, and it absorbs through your skin, and it collects in your kidneys and never leaves. To your a moldering in your grave, you will have that kid that that cobalt and cadmium, those heavy metals in your system. Okay, again, I, I sound like I'm really scaring you, but eh, they do deserves respect. Um, so I just don't use them very often. And if I do use them, they see that now I'm smearing those those tail lights with a palette knife. They look a lot better after I smear them. If you can't see it in the video, go and look at the, the order of the print from Fine Art America. You can get any size you want, and you can look at it really close. Uh, so that's my my take on the toxic paints. It's not they're not toxic because you swallow them. They're toxic because it goes in through your skin and goes to your kidneys, stays there forever. And it may still not be bad for you, but eh. I'm going to take. Besides, I, don't, I find I don't need them. Okay, let me finish a little bit about the colors. I use cobalt and I, I use <laughs> I use phthalo blue, which is actually P H T H A L O, short for phthalo cyanine. I'm not even going to bother spelling that. Phthalo blue and ultramarine. That gives me a warm blue and a cool blue. I find I can do anything I want with those two colors. Then in the red department, I have a lizard crimson. That's my cool red, and a naphthol crimson or a, a warm orangish kind of red. I'm trying to think of some of the names right now. I can't remember. As long as it doesn't have cadmium in it, I'm all right. Now, don't get a, a cobalt red hue because I can spot a red hue from across the room. And, and actually, so can you. Um, and the funny part is I've literally done this in painting classes before. I've literally stood across the room and said, um, is that a cadmium red hue? And it, every time, just about it is. Okay, so don't get hues with this one exception. Are you still listening to me? Wake up, wake up, I'm taking important stuff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the, the two of you who are left still watching this video <laughs> after an hour and 20 minutes. Cadmium yellow hues, on the other hand, work perfectly well. I can't tell any difference between those and the regular cadmium yellows. So knock yourself out. Here, once again, I'm using a rag. Any technique that can be done with dispatch without belaboring the point is legal. And again, imitating photography by putting these white lights in the center of the red. One of the new things I've learned in my painting process, I used to start my paintings, as you saw, with wild and loose energy. But then as the painting process went on, I got more and more tight. I'm trying to learn to continue to uh, put that kind of energy into every stage of the painting process. And some of what you see me doing here is that very thing, like the way I stroke, did some of those green strokes a moment ago, and the way I just used a palette knife to smear those uh, tail lights. I'm trying to not get too fussy. John Singer Sargent, I heard a great quote of him not long ago. He said, start out with a brush 
or uh, start out with a whisk and finish with a broom. He's referring there to the universal ten tendency of all artists to start with big brushes and end with tiny ones. And uh, the great John Singer Sargent kind of rebuking us in that ten tendency he says, no, no, keep your brushes big. And another way to say that is keep your energy, keep the energy in your painting uh, vivid. Don't get modeling, don't get too detailed. And you'll notice, I hope, that even at this point of detail, I'm not holding my brush with the penmanship grip. I'm still painting most of the time with the side of the brush because I'm after interesting marks, not after hyper control. Some of you are wondering now, who was it who asked Dan to post the entire painting process? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. You'd like to string them up, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, there's some energy. Yay. This is what painting is really like. I, I will say, if you're, if you're watching this, you're getting a, a realistic impression. Uh, yeah, good painting is kind of fast, but nah, not really. Um, this video, this particular video, is about an hour and 45 minutes long, and I, I did the painting over a period of three days. And what I've cut out, of course, is the cleaning my brush, cleaning my brushes, mixing my colors, um, all that kind of thing. So all you're seeing is a brush full of paint every time. I, I cut out, edit out the parts where I'm, you know, going over to the right to my palette, picking paint up off the palette with my brush. So it was probably seven hours of standing in, in my studio, I would, I would think. Seven hours. All I'm showing you is the part where I'm really actually literally putting paint on the canvas, reduced down to an hour and 45 minutes. So that's, oh, I, by the way, yeah, there we go. I'm showing it in slow motion. What in the world came over me? Why did I do that? And that, why did I do those two strokes? I don't know, but they're going to stay in the final painting. There's, that's one of those for every art, for every definitive mark, make an art mark. And that was an art mark that I really, really liked. It's just energy. The best, one of my favorite words, I've, I've used it a lot already in this video, haven't I? One of my favorite words for describing, and when I describe to, to non-artists, They'll, they'll say, well, why is that there? <laughs> the best answer I have is because I uh, need that energy. Needed that energy right there. And it, it's a balancing act, no, knowing where to put the energy and where to, to diminish it. But I, I am not in the business of copying a photograph. I'm in the business of creating a painting. As I already said, I'm not going to hang the photograph next to the painting on the wall and say, well, how did I do? <laughs> you probably already noticed. You can go back to the beginning and see it again. I, I modified the, the composition considerably. Uh, and no point, I didn't trace the, you know, the, the, the photograph onto the canvas. I have no interest in doing such a thing. The canvas is, the painting is supposed to be a radical improvement over the photograph. And in this case, I think it is. A lot of times when I'm painting on the street of any particular city, my job is the same. It's not My job is not to copy the street. My job is to create a beautiful painting. And yet capture somehow, this is the, the, the paradox, isn't it? Somehow I'm trying to capture the essence of that scene. I'm trying to help people who are not artistically gifted tap into a, a part of their soul that they're not very familiar with and people will come up to me and say wow that's beautiful it's a big improvement on the real thing or you know they'll say something like it's a lot that's a lot but looks a lot better than the real thing and and in a way they're right in a way they're correct but in another way nah one of the ways to describe the role of the artist is my job and our job as artists is to open up non-artists eyes people who are not artistically gifted, we open their eyes so that they can see the beauty of the world around them. Now, obviously, I'm describing a very particular kind of...